In this video, I want to talk with you about the concept of separating church and state, what that actually means. And in order to do so, we first want to ask, answer the question, should Christians talk about politics? So should Christians talk about politics? The answer to that, I would say, is Christians can talk about politics, but they need to talk about politics in the correct way. We were not given a king. We asked for a human king. We rejected God's prophet, and we asked for a human king. And you might say, well, I wasn't here when that happened. I wasn't here when the Israelites did that. That might be so, but if you are continuing to put your hope in a man, in a leader, you are guilty of the same thing. Let me explain. God says that he is the one who places these rulers over us, and he is the one who places these rulers over us when he is handing us over to the spirit that we have chosen. Romans 13, one says, obey the rulers who have authority over you. Only God can give authority to anyone and he puts these rulers in their places of power. Technically, we don't even need to vote in order for God to do that. And we are in this predicament because of what our ancestors chose and because of what we have continued. I'm not saying that the democratic system needs to be demolished. What I'm saying is God doesn't need your vote in order to put his spirit in a leader or put the spirit of Satan in a leader, does he? And he is the one who conforms all things in order for that leader to be appointed. So how do we need to look at the predicament that we're in? Do we need to look at it in terms of fighting with people and protesting, blaming leaders for all of our problems? No, we need to look at ourselves. If we're God's people and he says that he's the one who does these things, then can God not also contend with us through these leaders? If he's the one who sends hail, fire, flood, locusts, and plagues, if he's the one who shuts up the heavens so that it doesn't rain, and he contends with us in those ways, and he says, when I send these things, my people who are called by my name need to turn to me and recognize that they are being punished, that they have come under judgment. They need to return to me. Can God not also contend with us through our bodies? Can he not also contend with us through our elected officials, the people who are in power? Can he not place people over us, whether it's when we are in captivity or it's over our country, whatever it is, is God not sovereign? The way in which we talk about our power. Now the world may think that you need to go out there and vote and you need to go out there and do this and that. And you need to go protest and everything else. They may think that, but you're supposed to know better. You're supposed to know what God says. And what God says is when I send these things, my people need to return to me. God says he's the one who gives authority to whoever has authority and that he puts these rulers in their places of power. The Bible is the same truth forever. These things have not changed. God is still in a position of power and sovereignty over choosing the rulers and putting them in their places of power even handing his people over to those who are going to imprison them and burn them with fire and kill them by the sword during the Antichrist reign because his people didn't turn to him soon enough. I guess I just jumped right into it, but these are this is the truth. This is what we need to understand. This is what we're not understanding. That God is the one who does these things and that when we see that rulers are corrupt, when we see that alliances are being formed, and that our rulers are promoting the murder of unborn babies on the altar of Satan, we need to know what's going on. We need to understand that we've been handed over, that this isn't a left versus right wing issue. This is a spiritual issue, and that spiritual issue is regarding his people, because we're the ones who preserve the earth. We're the reason God is sending judgment, the world is already condemned. Now, is the same thing with science. Is it wrong to observe that certain things are happening? You know, when you poke your eye, it hurts or it bulges out a little bit. I don't know. Is it wrong to observe things? No. What's wrong is when you start implementing your own treatments and magic arts in order to avoid returning to God, who's sovereign over you, your life, your body, and who has already told us that he's our healer. 
when we start trying to take control of things by the work of our hands, fighting what God has sent. That's the key. God sends things for a reason. And so we are supposed to recognize those reasons and we're supposed to turn in the way that he's told us to turn, not in the way that man is telling us to turn through its sciences, its witchcraft, and its political systems. Now, I want to give you an example. There's a pastor named Ed Young in Houston, and he has been doing a series on entitled The Church Awake. And he's talking about what happens when, you know, you have left-wing people in office and regarding this woke culture. Now, admittedly, I haven't listened to a sermon. I listened to a piece of it. I don't listen to sermons. I don't listen to pastors. I am strictly Bible and by God's spirit. That's it. God taught me that lesson. I learned that lesson because every time I listened to a sermon, I ended up deceived. But I want you to listen to a piece of his sermon and the way that he is talking about politics. You see any difference when you put left wing progressives in office? Dr. Young reads off a list of numbers, which he says details rising crime in Houston and Harris County and his solution. If Houston and Harris County is to survive, we had better throw those bums out of office. They are not doing their job that we have called them to. Okay, so this is taken from KHOU 11 News. I don't endorse this news station. It seems a little like they are actually a little to the left, and I'm not for either, but I'm definitely not for the left. So then they introduce a left-wing progressive who says, oh, that's crossing the line because the opposite of voting for the left is voting for the right. Well, that may be, but there's also other options. It, you know, that's not the only option. And so what the reason he's in hot water is because as a nonprofit organization, the IRS stipulates that organizations are absolutely prohibited from directly or indirectly participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective public office. You see how it becomes a problem when you as a church become an organization that's now bound with a muzzle? That's the reason why this could never be what I am doing could never be an organized thing that's regulated, which means it will most likely not be the way that I'm paid because then you start to put a muzzle on truth or you have to, you know, speak in a particular way that the world is dictating. God would never set up his church that way. So one thing I will say is kudos to Dr. Young, because at least he has the courage to say these things from what I understand. It's not the first time he's been in hot water. Nevertheless, he's speaking incorrectly. He is leading the church that he's speaking in, which don't, mis don't confuse a church for the church. He's speaking in that church incorrectly. As much as he's yelling on stage and sounds very convicted, he's angry with a man while denying the sovereignty of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying his power. Because the Bible I'm reading in Romans 13, 1 says... Obey the rulers who have authority over you. Only God can give authority to anyone, and he puts these rulers in their place of power. Now, don't misunderstand obey the rulers who have authority over you. Obviously, if those rulers are conflicting with God's laws, you don't obey. He's not saying to receive the mark of the beast. He's not saying go get an abortion or bow down to Baal. But we do need to understand and acknowledge that God is sovereign and he has the ability to hand us over to the spirit we've chosen in order to contend with his people. And if his people believe that he's sovereign and believe the word and what it says, then the message that should be preached is not get out there and vote, is not knock these people off their platform. The message that should be preached is one of warning and repentance and return to God. Hey, we're supposed to recognize these things. What do you guys recognize is going on right now? God is flooding several places on this earth. He's scorching the earth with fire and heat. He's drying up all the grass of the land and he's sending hail. Do you think a trumpet has blown? What do you think a trumpet is? What has God said these things are? How has he taught his people to understand these things? Because the Bible I'm reading 
says that when he sends these things, his people need to return to him. They need to humble themselves, put on sackcloth and ashes, grieve, mourn, lament, weep, wail, and repent. Turn from their wicked ways. Truly rend their hearts to God. And Joel tells us he may relent and may even send a blessing. We don't have any power. We don't have any power, but the power that we invoke when we return to him, when we actually choose him and choose to rend our hearts to him. The message that this man is preaching is wrong. And it is not leading people to righteousness. It's leading them to trust in the work of their own hands. And it's leading them to hatred and anger and resentment that they are displacing because it's our own fault. How do you start displacing that onto someone else? If we return to him individually, we're going to have understanding here. So even if this has already been set in motion, which it has, it has been set in motion. We're going to understand individually that God will take care of us. We're not going to be afraid of rulers and what they can do to us. He's going to minister to us and he's going to cause us to understand that we are not to be afraid of those who rule over us. We're not to be afraid of those who can kill the body, but not kill the soul and body in hell. So this is not a message that's edifying the church. It is not a message that is leading the church correctly. It's a message of blame. It is a message of total unaccountability and lack of knowledge. Does God say that his people perish from lack of knowledge because they did not love truth? Because the truth of it is, is that if we understood what was going on, the message that would be preached is that we are experiencing violence, plague, global warming, and we have rulers who promote lawlessness because of the decisions that we have made because we have turned away from the living God, because we have placed our trust and faith and hope in man and the work of our own hands. The message should not be trust, therefore, more in the work of your own hands, because that's only going to lead to worse outcomes, to more judgment by God. Now, we need to talk about this concept of the separation between church and state, because this is being touted as though it's somehow biblical, as though this is what God wants, as though this is what God said. Do you know who first talked about separation between church and state? That was Thomas Jefferson. You know, only about over 17,000 years after Christ. So why are we continuing to repeat this rhetoric? God never even desired the governments and leaders that we have today. He desired for us to submit to him. It was the Israelites who requested this because they saw that the world did this and that's what they wanted. But we're supposed to know better. We're supposed to submit to whatever God places over us and recognize that if it's not good, it's because we're not doing good. And if it's good, then let's continue to go deeper in to him, not to politics. We're supposed to recognize how we're supposed to be living and to submit and believe in his sovereignty. When God gave the Israelites their king and subsequent kings, there was an interaction between how God was bringing judgment on them versus how they were living. There was an interaction between how they were living and the kings that he placed over them. And really a bi-directional relationship because those kings would then lead them in a particular way either to erect Asherah poles or to tear down Asherah poles, for example. And the people were either blessed for obedience or they were punished for disobedience. Exactly as God set up in the very beginning, it's pretty simple. He's been following the same rules he established since the beginning. So there was a bi-directional relationship. The people chose wickedness. A wicked ruler was placed over them. And then that wicked ruler took them into more wickedness. The people returned to him. He placed a righteous ruler over them. And that righteous ruler led them into righteousness. Then he blessed them for obedience. You see how that works? It's the same thing now. Same rule applies. If my people who are called by my name will turn to me, I will turn to them. And he's kept good on that word. We can see that throughout biblical history. Hopefully, you see that in your own life. If you haven't, you need to turn to him. 
So look, Thomas Jefferson likely established the separation of church and state, and this was likely part of his belief system because of what had been going on in England, because of the incredible oppression and persecution of the Church of England, the Catholic Church. People were escaping religious persecution, so this was to be, the, the United States was to be, was set apart by God in order for his people to worship him. Do you remember God saying that through Moses, Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can worship me? That's what God did again, you know, same pattern. Let my people go so that they can worship me. The United States was established as a place for religious freedom in order for us to be able to worship God. Don't make the mistake of focusing on the men. You need to understand that it is the people who came here, who God was concerned about. It was not the men who founded this country. I understand that some of them were Freemasons or whatever. I don't know whether that's true or not. Sounds like it could be. I don't really care personally because, again, it's not about the rulers doing something. It's about what God is doing. God established this place as a place for his people to worship him. And perhaps he didn't appoint founders who were so righteous so that we wouldn't be venerating and worshiping them like we're in the habit of doing with political figures. We need to understand that whether a person who goes into the office is right wing or left wing, the spirit that God chooses to place in them is the spirit that's going to rule over us. It is ridiculous to think that someone is going to be righteous because they're on the right side. The only thing that I will say about this is that if they're on the left, they inevitably stand for laws that are in direct opposition to God. So that's an automatic problem. I'm not going after any politician. I could care less about politicians, quite frankly. I'm going after the rules, such as killing unborn babies, that are in direct opposition to what my God desires. And I understand that when God's people start going after those things and choosing things that are in opposition to him, what he has established as right, we get handed over to the spirit we've chosen. But that doesn't happen just because of voting. You could That could happen without you voting. You want to go pursue a, a false gospel? You'll get handed over to the spirit that distorted that false gospel. You want to go pursue false gods through science to heal you? You'll get handed over to those gods. See what they can do for you. You understand how God works? I'm not making this up. This is what his word says. This is what his word says about who he is and what he will do. As far as church and state goes, God does desire that we will choose his spirit and then he can put his spirit into the people who rule over us. He will choose good rulers over us. And you got to understand what is meant by church in God's word. Because we've distorted that language. Now we don't even understand what this might mean. Not to man, but to God. What would that mean? God's church is in the believer and collectively in the believers. We're being fitted together as a temple to rise as holy before the Lord. It is fitted together in the body of Christ. So if you have a person in office who has the spirit of God, and they are leading the people, guess what? The church is there. On the other hand, if you have a ruler who has the spirit of Satan in them, guess what church is there? There's never actually a separation of church and state, you guys. You can see the ideology of that church of Satan, of the synagogue of Satan, that is implementing its agenda. Have you seen the ideolo ideologies change? Do you see that there are like, why are there trans people on TikTok going into the White House, bumping fists with Jen Psaki? What is that all about? Why are politicians on both the right and the left, by the way, having anything to do with Pope Francis if there is a separation of church and state? Why are they appealing to him in order to influence voters and influence the Catholic Church towards a particular political agenda if there is no separation of church and state. The Catholic Pope has been involved in 
state for a very long time. In fact, that entire religion was set up as a political endeavor initially by Constantine. He wanted the support of Christians, but understand that on a deeper level, what the spirit of Satan was doing by establishing that church, that institution of churches, that is not the church. The church doesn't worship in a temple or in Jerusalem or dot, dot, dot in a cathedral or a mega church or anything else. They worship in truth and in spirit. That's what Jesus said in John 4. So if we're using the right language, we're going to understand what God desires and stop saying things that people said as though they're in the word. Because I would say that there's never a separation of church and state. We either have the spirit of God in us or we have the spirit of Satan in us. That's consistent across humanity. And the spirit that's in us is going to indicate the church that's in us, the good church or the bad church, because that's what we've been designed to be. We've been designed to be a temple, a vessel, a church to be inhabited by God. And if we're not, then obviously we're inhabited by Satan because we don't inhabit ourselves. There is never a separation of church and state. Whoever is saying these things doesn't know what they're talking about. We should first be concerned about the spirit that is inhabiting us and returning to God and recognizing what's going on. Because here's what you need to understand. We are building up to a time when the spirit that is occupying the person in power over us is the spirit of Satan. It's only a matter of time before the church that they are associated with, the larger antichrist is set up. It's only a matter of time. This should be a warning to us. We should be able to see with spiritual spiritual eyes what's happening right now. And I've talked with you about that coming together of that church, of that bad woman the harlot that is riding the church that is riding the beast. What is a beast? A beast is a system of government. I've talked with you about how the spirits in each of those people, each of those kings is coming together to form the beast, to form the beast that that woman has been riding. She's been fornicating with these kings She's been fornicating with these government systems for a long time, has she not? And she's got her own agenda. She's got something in mind that she wants to do. And so the little horn that's going to rise out of that beast system will be papal Rome, and they will come into power again. I read an article to you the other day on one of these videos regarding the Pope advocating for secularism, saying that... God does not want a combination of church and state. Says who? And part of what I explained to you is some of what I've explained to you in this video that we don't have a separation of church and state. Whatever spirit is occupying those who are running the country, they belong to a church, okay? Whether it's a counterfeit church or it is the church of God, belong to a church. It's not the church that is executing things on people. It's the spirit of Satan in that church that has persecuted people through Catholicism because that's his church. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be an organized church. You understand? It's the spirit of Satan, the spirit of the Antichrist. God's perfectly capable of moving the leaders to do what the people have chosen by choosing his spirit, by returning to him. So you need to recognize that there are already political leaders such as John Kerry who are going to the Pope and appealing to him, enlisting him to perpetuate propaganda, political propaganda. Do you hear him doing that? Because I've read you a few articles where he promotes wokeism and he does not ever, I never see him actually speaking on the word of God. He just distorts everything according to his own agenda. Never do I hear him speaking on the word of God as though the word of God holds any authority whatsoever. It's always some spin and some Catholic teaching. So be careful about thinking that things are going to show up in the way that they have historically. 
in a organized religion kind of way because the message that the pope was putting out the other day had nothing to do i mean he doesn't even have any regard for that the spirit in him does not even have any regard for that out of one side of his mouth he's he's saying that you know god has been removed and out of the next side of his mouth he's saying He's advocating for secularism. He doesn't really stand for anything. He's just trying to appeal to everybody. And in that way, people can just, you know, basically make up their own theology of what they believe he believes, right? Just like they do. They just make things up as they go along. And whatever their priests say becomes incorporated into their theology and their doctrine. So you have to understand that this rising of power is already starting to happen it just may not happen in the way that you think it's going to happen. When John Kerry goes and appeals to the Pope, he's appealing to the power, the papal power. Do you understand what that even signifies in Revelation? He is appealing to the papal power to influence. And so they will give more power to the papal power in order to get their agenda passed. And you have to understand that, that these are God's words. They're going to be fulfilled. But also understand that it's the spirit in them that really does not care as long as he gets control. He doesn't care whether a message of, of counterfeit Christ comes out of the mouth of the Pope or whether it's a message of secularism. He doesn't even care if it's a vague, ambiguous message of both which is what I read to you the other day. I mean, I still am like baffled at what the heck does he stand for? Which side is he on? Or which side is he trying to pretend he's on? It actually seems to be more, more likely that what is going to happen is that there's going to be a message of secularism and integration and reconciliation. These are the words that he uses, by the way. I'm not making up words. Secularization, integration, and that is integration of evil, okay? We don't want to alienate the LGBTQ plus community. We need to integrate. And by integrate, he means that needs to become part of your ideology. That needs to become part of the church. He goes around telling people who were abused by the Catholic church who end up having that spirit that they were born, that, that they were created, rather, to be gay. That the creator created them to be gay. Do you think he's scratching the back of that demonic political system? Of course he is. So I'm not so sure that this is actually going to look like it did previously where there was a counterfeit Christian system. It seems to me that it's going to actually look more like a woke church that it's going to look a little bit more worldly. And still, people will still be deceived. Don't think for a second that they won't be deceived. And Daniel eleven thirty seven says that he will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. I have a feeling, based on the way that things are going, that in order to appeal to more people, that this is going to become very, very worldly. I can already see the language being very diluted in order to appeal to the world. That people within that church are going to begin to also appeal more to the world because we know the way that he distorts things, the way that he distorts language, the way that the love of Christ is being distorted, for example, in order to mean that we have to tolerate a, a sin and incorporate that into the church. So pay attention to what a church actually is. If God says that his church is in the believer, in the believers who worship him in truth and in spirit, then the opposite of that, the counterfeit church, where are they worshiping? In falsehood and in that spirit and in their flesh. As it is, that's exactly what we see. You don't see that happening in the heart and the spirit. They're not even allowed to get into the heart and the spirit because they're too busy being told what to think and do in ritual by a person. They don't even know the Bible. Everyone I've ever talked with does not know the Bible because I, that's what I speak on. That's what I reference. And they don't know it. They refer to what the priest said to them, what they learned in a teaching rather than what they learn in the word, which is why I tell you, you have to know the word. You got to know the word. 
If I talk about something that you're not familiar with, you got to go to the word and make sure that you familiarize yourself and that you're being accountable. You know, I want to give you another example to help kind of solidify this because I know that this is more abstract. It is spiritual symbolism that God is using and I want you to be able to get it, to be able to understand. Trans people often talk about being anti-religion, but you have to understand that what they are doing by cutting off their genitalia, for example, I wrote about this in A Soul Aligned. They are actually engaging, those are practices that are still practiced today, but that's a thousand, like thousands of years old religion called Gnostic dualism. Actually, I'm going to read to you about it from a soul aligned so that you can understand that this is a religion so that what I'm talking with you about with regard to what spirit is occupying a person and the ideology that they're putting out there and promoting and uh, particularly when the spirit of Satan is coercing others to go along with that and refer to them by these pronouns and acknowledge them and everything else, that's a religion. That is a religion. It has its roots in religion called Gnostic dualism. It's a cult, but it's still a religion. But now it's being put off as someone's identity. And it's just another way to sort of sock it to the creator. I reject what you created. Hate the creator, hate the creation. Ashtoreth, referred to in Judges 2.13, 10.6, Samuel 7.3, and 12.10, was a goddess who confused gender by promoting cross-dressing in biblical times. As priests of Sibel, the Galli devoted themselves to their goddess by castrating themselves, apparently removing both the testicles and the penis, cross-dressing, and in some cases, offering themselves to other men for sex. A tax may even have been levied on them as prostitutes. The Galli were often described in derogatory terms such as pathicus, meaning faggot, Mollus, meaning softy and, or senatus, originally an Eastern dancer, but later a term for a grown man who displayed effeminate behavior and or desired to be penetrated. Being a gallus was deemed the ultimate in unmanliness. Andres, 2015. Why would Satan want us to celebrate unmanliness? To eliminate reproduction, defile the sanctity of marriage that God so loves, that he uses in our covenant, and to covet and destroy God's creation of man. The castration of God's children, sacrifice of God's children to Baal, breaking down of the temple, and the choice to defile the temple with abominations will result in desolation. It will incite God's jealous wrath. These are but a few of the crawling things that showed that were, God showed to Ezekiel in the temple. So I took that out of a soul aligned uh, on my copy of the book. It's page at the bottom of page 745 to 746. So you understand that this is something that people used to do. And in fact, I think I missed a part. I did miss a part. Earlier on in 745, it's, I, I wrote, castration most often refers to the removal of a male's testicles and or penis. Historically, castration was used on captive enemies and criminals to enfeeble them by reducing androgen production, thereby reducing aggression, eliminate reproduction, and humiliate them by neutering their masculinity. It was also forced on prepubescent boys to prevent sexual maturity, to produce a specialized labor force for positions of truest that did not require brute labor, such as courtiers, government officials, and civil servants, guardians of elite women, especially in royal harems, upper servants in wealthy households, military officials, and singers. These two emasculated groups were a stark contrast to self-made eunuchs. So now we're talking about those who choose to be castrated. Adult males who voluntarily cut off their gen genitals to serve the object of their worship. Religious castration continues to exist up to the present day, openly in India and secretively elsewhere. Moreover, a surprising number of gods in different cultures were castrated, a mutilation that, was par that paradoxically tended to increase rather than diminish their powers. Wade, 2019. So all of this to establish, really, that this is a religion. And what is happening within a religion or a church is being dictated by the spirit that presides over that church, that dwells inside of that temple. You understand the symbolism that God has taught us regarding what it means for us to be a temple 
what it means for us to be identified as part of his church, that's going to occur in the spirit that's occupying our heart. That's what identifies us as the church. So that's also what identifies them as their own church of Satan, as a synagogue of Satan. There's no separation of church and state. You got to decide what church, what spirit you want to occupy your leaders. And then the way that you exert your own power over that is by returning to God, by choosing him yourself and then teaching others to do the same. So this teacher, albeit false teacher, who is teaching people to place their hope and faith in man, in politicians, is quite frankly causing his own grief. If he just taught the people correctly and understood the word of God correctly, then he could teach them how to discern and recognize what spirit we have in government right now. Rather than putting himself out there, declaring something with such conviction that really doesn't even have to do with the spirit of God, is in opposition to what he taught. That man is screaming his own message. He's speaking on his own authority. Because the truth is that we need to be shepherding people to return to God, not dictating who they should be voting for or how they should be holding our politicians accountable. If they hold themselves accountable, God will hold their politicians accountable. If we treat God like he doesn't matter, don't be surprised when he appoints people to treat us like we don't matter. Don't be surprised when those who are in positions of upholding the law no longer want to uphold the law. Quite frankly, I don't blame them because there's no support. You have a lawless society that turns on you for doing what you were hired to do and placed in a position to do. Don't be surprised when they don't want to do it. We have to choose whether we're going to be law abiding and maintaining the order that God established or we're going to be lawless. And then we have to understand when that's exactly what we receive return because we're going to be made to understand why God established law and order to begin with. We have to have regard for him first. This is not some sort of law of manifestation or law of attraction. This is what God has said, that he will bless for obedience. He will punish for disobedience. We will receive logical consequences for our behavior. And those logical consequences, if we have disobeyed, that logical punishment is going to be conformed by God in such a way that we are going to learn why we needed what he established to begin with. Isn't that what a good parent does? They discipline their child to understand. They discipline their child to obey what is needed. They teach their child in that discipline. All right, to summarize this video, what I would like to say is that it is most important for us to return to God. It's most important that we repent and that we receive his ministry Because once we begin to change, our environment is going to change because he is going to conform that. He's going to bless us for our obedience. Additionally, if you understand how that works in your own life because you're receiving his ministry and you see what he's doing with you, you're going to understand how that works in others. When you're fanning into God's flame, He is going to cause you to behave in certain ways that are consistent and congruent with his integrity. And likewise, that's what's going to happen to the leaders that he chooses to rule over you. He has every ability to cause that person to be inhabited by his spirit. He has every ability to conform things to work for the people who actually love and respect him. So please understand that when this happens, when this antichrist system rises, it will be the result of what his people have chosen. It will be the result of the spirit that they have chosen. And it will be the result of the consequences that God has seen fit to send. The discipline that is required because he tried to cleanse them and they would not be cleansed. And therefore they will not be cleansed again until his wrath has subsided. This has already been set in motion, at least from what I hear from God, I understand that this has already been set in motion. Don't let that be a reason why or a reason for you to delay returning to him because these things are already already going to happen. It should be all the more reason to return to him so that you pray that you are not here 
during that time, that you are spared from living during that time because you need to remember that the word says that those people pray for death. They they desire death, but it eludes them. Have a long-term perspective. Have the perspective that you don't want to be here longing for death and that God has said, don't fear those who kill the body. Fear the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. That God's word indicates that those who die for him and suffer for him are have honor with him, that they're going to be priests of God. I know that that's an intense message, but it has to be said because no one's saying it. No one seems to understand what we've been called to bear these very last days, not even end times. We're in the last days, the last years, although we don't have those years to get it together. We need to get it together now so that we're spared from going through what God says is going to come on those who continue to spurn him and refuse to accept him until the very last minute. I pray that this message reaches you. I know it's a hard message to hear, but I really do pray that it gets in, that the Holy Spirit testifies to it and works within your heart to understand what it is that I'm talking about here. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.